I prayed that night and I said, God, I need you to reveal to me what is going on because in the natural, it seemed like everything was perfect. I thought we had the perfect marriage and we didn't have financial struggles and there was no sickness in the family. So I was going through all the lists of what could be happening, why my body is, is tearing down. So I prayed and I said, Jesus, you're going to have to reveal it to me. And when I had that dream, I was like, oh my gosh, how did my mind go there? Yeah. And then I went, oh my gosh, God is revealing to mm. me sexual perversion in our marriage. That night I made dinner and we're talking and I said, how long have you been having an affair? Well, I'm looking at the divorce rates as of May 2024 in America, and they've gone to about 42%. Now, this is crazy. It has been a steady decline since the 70s, but that's four in every 1,000 people are getting divorced. That's a that's a huge number. I realized that only 2.4 per 1,000 people was getting divorced in 2022. So it's just two years ago, it was almost half that, or maybe one third of that. And so you look at this, there's there's something going on right now, especially with second uh, marriages. They're ending in 60 to 70% divorce, according to the same groups that now uh, analyze this. So Centers for Disease Prevention and Control even analyzes this every single year. So with divorce at all-time high, and the church divorce rates are much lower, thank God, from this, but they're still at an all-time high. So with Christians going through divorce, with mainstream culture, not putting marriage as something that we would be faithful or committed to on the way that it was 50 years ago, 80 years ago, something needs to change right now. And we have a guest today who just went through one of the most dramatic divorces in modern history. Uh, some of you know her, her name is Drew Hammer. Let me tell you a little bit about Drew because Drew is an incredible businesswoman and has dedicated two decades to philanthropic ministry. And she served on a board of a number of the Arm & Hammer Foundation for 22 years and spent nine years with the Los Angeles Dream Center supporting women's discipleship and victims of human trafficking. She is now the CEO and founder of HammeredHeart.org, helping women and children through difficult times. And she's also on the National Board for Child Help, which is a charity of victims of child abuse. In 2024, she's launched GetHope.ai, a platform where she answers questions on the Bible's relevance and hosts a daily Bible walkthrough. And inspired by her father's healing ministry, Drew's passionate about sharing faith and hope for others. So I wanted to talk to Drew today because she has shared a book recently where she goes through the, the really vulnerable, raw process of divorce, but she shares a really prophetic journey and how God led her, even showing her in the beginning of the story of her divorce, God showed her the insidious demon that was plaguing her husband, led him to do affairs and adultery and which he wouldn't repent of which led to the divorce. So it wasn't like a divorce where she caught him cheating. God showed her him cheating and it led to a completely different life. And it wasn't easy, but man, God did a redemption story and a restoration story like you've never heard. Not restoring the marriage, but restoring Drew and her boys and even her husband before, or ex-husband before he passed away. You're gonna really need this story in this time because many of us have friends that are going through divorce, parents going through divorce, grandparents going through divorce, and we need to hear the hope of what God brings in the midst of when relationships or some of the core relationships of our life break down. Up next is Drew Hammer. Well, Drew, we are here to hear your story, and I think this is going to bring a lot of hope to a lot of people. And I know you've already been uh, touring around sharing about the book you've written, but you have a story that I think is one of the most unique I've ever heard. I got to read your book and just go through it. And this is not an, even an advertisement. We didn't have you on here to advertise a book, but to really bring people into an awareness of what God's doing, especially when it comes to areas that so much of culture is getting affected by, like divorce or like family brokenness. Right. And you've walked through it. I mean, you, and you've walked through it where the tabloids have told their side of the story and you were able to tell your side of the story. And it brought so much to me, completion to people who are, needing to know, needing that, needing help, needing, needing some, needing some heart work, needing some, I don't know, just revelation. It was like reading revelation to me. It was like reading a revelation oh, of someone's God. life, like you and God Thank together. You. So kind of take us on the journey. Tell us who you are for people who don't know. And then take us on the journey of what God's been doing. Thank you, Sean. Um, well, I wrote my book because it was a 10 year journey. You know, we don't want to rush into anything, do we? 10 years is a long and time. <laughs> 
<laughs> I kept putting it down. I'm like, I can't do this, God. And the funny thing is, I got a D in my first English paper in college. So I'm the most <laughs> least likely person in the world to ever write a book. I don't even read a lot of books. But I'm telling you, Sean, the Lord would not let me let it go. And I know why, because I've already gotten so many beautiful uh, DMs or however they get a hold of me on my website saying, oh my gosh, I realized I had not forgiven and I've wow. held this bitterness and everything that you've been through, you know, people have hurt you, but you've been able to let it go. And I, I always respond by saying, because it's bigger than we are. Yeah. And yeah. when we're living in this life, there's so many things that are bigger than we are. And that's why we need to trust a living God, the creator of the universe and us. And he brought us into this world to have a relationship with him. And, but we have to turn to him. And mm -hmm. we also have to relinquish power because if we try to do it on our own, it's fruitless. And I'm really thrilled because I already feel like God is using this to help people. Because to me, it is certainly not about book sales. I even told yeah. my team, I said, don't even tell me how many books I'm selling. I don't care. I want well, to know. I don't think the average normal person is going to write how you did because there's a level of vulnerability where it's like you took your family's clothes off to show how right. God can heal you. So I don't think this is going to be a normal process that, you know, no. there's, there's those people like the Kardashians who want to show everything, but there's no resolution in it. You were right. giving people kind of a beginning, middle and end of a really hard story, but it's a story that like, I'm so glad you told. So like, even like how you yeah. start the book where you're starting in, you're in bed with your husband and you have a demonic dream of basically a yeah. sexual spirit. That's adultery in his life that you had to confront him on. Like who starts a book that way? Right. Uh, well, and that's not, right. that's not normal. So take us before we get there, you're part okay. of the, you married in the Hammer family, which you didn't yeah. really know that much about when you married no. into them. You had no idea. They're like, I mean, they're kind of like the Rockefellers, the Kennedys, or they're like, they're, they're this huge right. worldwide family. And you marry into them and it ended up becoming a lot, it, very defining in your life to marry into them. Yes. And so this became part of the journey of a 25 year marriage, I believe. Yes, that's right. So tell, take us on that story a little bit. Well, you know, I'm a small town girl. I always say when I met Michael and moved to L.A., I was like Ellie Mae Clampett because <laughs> it's true. I went to Oklahoma State University. I two-stepped on the weekends. But, Sean, we I'm glad we got to speak beforehand because we were raised very similar. Mm. And my parents found Jesus when I was five years old. They were oh, filled wow. with the Holy Spirit. You know, my dad's business partner ended up being Or Roberts' son-in-law. My dad led his son-in-law to Jesus. And Kenneth Hagen would come to our house and teach a Bible study. Oh, wow. So, wow. you know, we really had the best of the best of great men of faith and the supernatural. So when my dad was called into a healing ministry, he was a businessman. Mm -hmm. And he said, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I will never take up an offering. That was just his way. There's nothing wrong with taking yeah. up an offering. But he said, God, if you bless my businesses, I'll go. Within two weeks, two men came in and bought two of his banks. He put the money in a foundation, and for 45 years, we traveled around the world. So when I met Michael on the airplane, I was coming back from a mixed doubles tennis tournament. He walked on the plane. The Lord spoke to me and said, that's who you're going to marry. And I was like, way to go, God. He's so good looking. And oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it was important. Yes, oh, my God. Right? Now, was he even a Christian at the time? Oh, no. But <laughs> the first lunch, he invited me to lunch the next day. And the first lunch, I started telling him about Jesus because everyone, all my friends will tell you, if you spend more than five minutes with Drew Hammer, you're going to hear about Jesus. It's wow. just the way it is because it's my priority. And like you said, you saw me on Charlie Kirk. What good is our Christianity if we aren't out going out, spreading mm -hmm. the word, sharing the gospel, leading people to Jesus? You know, what's the point? Yes, we have a fulfilled life, but it's so important that we're evangelists. I believe every yeah. Christian is called to be an evangelist. I so understand. I start telling him about Jesus. And he said to me, I had a grandmother that was a Russian baroness. She was the Betty Grable of Russia. And when I would go see her, it was the only place in my life I felt safe. And she had crucifixes. She was a Russian Orthodox. Oh, wow. And at night, we would 
kneel down at the bed and we would pray. And I've never had any other Christian influence in my life. So when I spoke to him about that, because he felt so safe with his grandmother, that it was just, he was like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. And I took him back to my dad and I told dad, now listen, I've been a, brought other guys to you and I didn't care if they came or went or, you know, whatever. But this one, just take it easy. Well, he didn't listen to me. And two years, I mean, two hours later, he was saved. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. And it changed his life forever. But I will say that there were infidelities in our marriage and we never dealt with the with his abusive background. Mm. He was sexually and physically abused. We never dealt with it because I didn't even know the extent. It wasn't mentioned. It was swept under the carpet. If I would have known then what I know now, we would have been in years of Christian counseling and therapy because you have to deal with these yeah. things. But, you know, yeah. growing up Pentecostal, I just figure you go to church and you pray about it. You know, that's yeah. all I knew. So now we have more tools. Well, and it looks like through the book and what I read in your story, um, so I'm leading you with the, basically what I read, not what I actually know. Yeah. But um, it looks like you guys, he, he did all the right things except for right. the infidelity. Like he was a great husband. You had date night every yes. Friday night. He would bring you flowers all the time. He was a oh. good father. You guys oh. were going to church together, like all the right things. So why do you think it took even 25 years before God showed you like, okay, now it's a breaking point? Well, it actually, seven years into it, I found out about infidelities. Okay. And my children were five and three, and I loved him. I believe in forgiveness. And yeah. I did not want my sons growing up without a father because he didn't have a strong family unit. He was shipped off to boarding school very young. He didn't know how to be a family. And he never had a loving father. And I knew if we divorced... He would not have the tools, pardon the pun, being a hammer, yeah. to be there for our children like that. Because I kind of, I was kind of his mentor, and I was the spiritual leader of the family, which is not my rightful place. Mm -hmm. But I have to give him credit. I threw him in the deep end, and he went for it. But seven years in, I chose to forgive, and there was repentance. And repentance means you turn 180 degrees from the 360 and you, okay. like Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, he said, your sins are forgiven, but go and sin no more. So yes, we're saved by grace, but we also have to do our part. And I believed after seven years, he told me he would never do it again. He was very repentive. And I don't know, I, you know, people say to me, when you look back, did you see signs? And I go, I really didn't yeah. because he was home Every day after work, we texted 10 times a day. We were best friends. We never fought. I mean, very rarely yeah. we have arguments. We had a true love affair. But he went to the Bel Air Hotel at lunchtime. And, you know, I didn't know for 19 more years. But I always say, maybe God put horse blinders on me until my sons were grown. Because it was tough enough when they were 22 and 24 to see their parents divorce. But yeah. it's you know, even more catastrophic, I believe, when they're still in the home, they're in high school, a very pinnacle age. So we don't know God's plan. But what I do know is at the 25 year, this time there was no repentance. And I always say it takes two to tango, yeah. you force someone to come back. And of course, he realized that he made the biggest mistake of his life. And he used to call me all the time sobbing, saying, I made the biggest mistake of my life. And I'm like, yep, you sure did. Yeah. But what are you going to do? You know, you just forgive. We ended up being wonderful friends in the end. I was there when he was dying on his deathbed, and I was praying over him and exonerating him of what an amazing husband he was for 25 years, an incredible father. And only God could have allowed me to help me forgive like he did and to be able to have a friendship like that. And that's part of well, my message. And I, I sense your compassion even earlier when you were saying like there's we just have tools and I think of the tools we have now and they're still not being used enough because we're still ending at right. fifty percent divorce rate. So there's still right. I mean almost everybody has a therapist or can get one now and it's not 
as shameful or as weird as it was. No, I'm in counseling and therapy right now. So it's like, there's, it's not weird. Like it was 25 years ago, right. 30 years ago. Right. It's, and there's all kinds of inner healing in the church or there's all kinds of deliverance in the yeah. church. There's all kinds of, there's talks in the church about just how psychology and, and whether it's anxiety or whether it's even infidelity, infidelity it's like, it's talked right. about more with the sense of compassion and empathy. And it wasn't, there was, so I hear your heart and having some level of compassion for this man who was trying to do all the right things, but he had a secret life that you've, I mean, if someone has a secret life, even for their wife, it's a secret life. God had to reveal it to you, right? which he did right. in a very profound dream. Before we get there, I want to just, just define who the hammers were like and who they are, because okay. a lot of our people might just see the brand. They might know a brand name, but they don't know the family. Yes. Well, Armand was a Russian Jew and he was a medical doctor, went to Russia for his residency because his family came over, you know, he was first generation American and he went over there to do his residency because they thought there was a huge typhoid epidemic. And he's oh. like, there's no typhoid epidemic. These people are starving to death. And Armand went to Columbia to get his medical degree. And during that time, he literally turned his father's pharmaceutical company around and had a million dollars cash in the bank. And in, in, you know, 1919 or 1920, that was worth like a hundred million. At yeah, that for sure. And he goes over and gets a meeting with Lenin and says, your people are starving to death. We have a bumper crop. We are burning wheat in America and it's selling for less than a dollar a bushel. I will buy a hundred, I mean, a million bushels of wheat and I will ship it over to Russia. And then he did it in exchange of the czar's jewels and Fabergé eggs and artwork. And that's how he started. He bought Occidental Petroleum. In his retirement, in his 50s, there were three empo employees. He bought it for $150,000. And now today, Occidental is worth over $60 billion or something crazy. Oh my gosh. So he, you know, and it, the funny thing is all through, I've read, oh, Armin Hammer was a communist. I'm like, hmm, no, I believe he was a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't know what he did Very being much, a communist, yeah. right? But um, I actually even had the privilege. I know God put me in that family for so many reasons, but also almost every single family member, except for the aunt that did that sad documentary of lies. But I had the privilege of leading every single one of them wow. to Jesus, wow. including Armand. I led him to Christ as a 91-year-old Russian oh my gosh. Jew. And I gave him the book. I, he would come over and I would minister to him. I said, you come to our house every Sunday for supper because they didn't even know how to be a family. You yeah. know, Armand was a workaholic and the father was an alcoholic and, you know, addicted to prescription pills. There was never a family unit. There's only five members. Armi Armand oh. only had one child. And then Julian, his child, had Michael, my husband, and his sister, Casey. So there was nobody in the family. And I come from wow. this Pentecostal Norman Rockwell, you know, matching flannel pajamas at Christmas <laughs> with a king's monogrammed on it. So I'm like... Have I landed in the twilight zone when I met this Seriously. Family? So I said, Armand, I want you to come to our house every Sunday that you're in town. And I can't believe I said this. I was 24 years old because I need to teach you how to be a family. And I'm, I look back and I'm like, I cannot believe I said that. That's unbelievable. But anyway, he came. Yeah. And I bought him a Bible. I outlined in Isaiah 53 and, and six, all the prophecies of the coming Messiah, Messiah how Jesus fulfilled those. Wow. Then I gave him the book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Oh, I love that book, yeah. I know. And I thought, well, he's an intellectual and he probably tries to intellectualize the whole thing. And after my dad and I led him to Christ, he called me a week later and he said, hey, Drew, you know that book you gave me by Clive? And I'm like, Clive? I'm like, no, Boompa, I don't know it, Clive. We called him Boompa because my kids couldn't say grandpa. And he goes, <laughs> yes, you do, Clive. You know, the book you gave me. I go, Clive? And he goes, yes, C.S. Lewis. I go, Clive? He goes, oh, yeah, he was a friend of mine. We used to hang out at Oxford. And I'm like, oh, oh now gosh. you tell me that? Are you kidding me? And Tolstoy. I mean, it's the craziest. That's amazing. I know. So he said, would you do me a favor and buy me a dozen copies? I want to give them out to all of my rabbis. And oh I said, now you're an evangelist? Is that unreal? So I am so dangerous because I don't care where anybody comes from, how old they are, 
what the religious background is. Yeah. Everybody needs and wants Jesus, and I'm going to share it with them. So I, I just believe in blooming where you're planted and wherever God puts me, Absolutely. I can share the gospel. I had the privilege of sharing to Gorbachev and Princess Di and you name it. I just went well, for we, it. We, I hope we have time for those stories, but if we don't, okay. maybe we'll have a part okay. two because those are so important. But I want to get back into this because, okay. and I love all those, like when I'm saying that, in no way do I not want to hear those stories and I know our no, audience no, does. No. I want to get back into it because I'm thinking <laughs> of how I opened up where it's like you are sleeping next to your husband and God gives you a dream. Yes. Because it's really protecting you in the family, even though something's about to blow up. He's protecting you from staying in this unhealthy relationship that you don't even know is unhealthy. Like yes. you, you mentioned you went to your doctor. He's like, there's something wrong. You couldn't figure right. it out because everything felt right. Right. So you tell this man who you're in love with, who you always loved the rest of his life and the rest of your life in, in some way, even if it was just yes. his friends. Absolutely. But I mean, like you had this sense of like, that's what I love about the book is that you're so real about that. Like you're so real about your whole feelings all the way through the book. But you wake up next to him and you, from this terrible dream where you see this demonic spirit of sexuality that's on him that he's now participating with. And you have to confront him with this. Like, talk about there's there's men and women who are like, there's something wrong in my marriage. And it's yes. spiritual. There's a spiritual thing that's going on. And for you, it was like a direct you had to directly confront it. Not everybody right. has to directly confront it. They don't know what it is. But talk about that moment. Talk about like how that started a series of events that were really hard, but that you, you right. would see like God kept coming in and like showing you like, I'm going to lead you all the way. Cause that's yeah. the part that's the hardest. If you don't have Jesus, it's I don't know how people cool. even get through this. I, I, I have know. little, I no understanding at all. Cause it's hard enough know. with Jesus, right? Yeah. It's a tough life. It's not for sissies. Well, first of all, I really believe that sometimes our spirit man knows things that we haven't ca quite caught up mm. with. And my wow. body was falling apart. And that's why I went to the doctor and he was like, what is going on? Your body temperature is 92. Your thyroid is shut down. You're anemic, yada, yada. And when I drove home that night after visiting with my doctor, I said, God, obviously my spirit man knows something that my physical man doesn't know yet, wow. but it's reacting to that. And I prayed that night and I said, God, I need you to reveal to me what is going on. Because in the natural, it seemed like everything was perfect. I mean, Army just booked social network, his first big movie. My son, Victor, was at Pepperdine and fell in love with his soulmate. And I thought we had the perfect marriage and we didn't have financial struggles and there was no sickness in the family. So I was going through all the lists of what could be happening, why my body is is tearing down. So I prayed and I said, Jesus, you're going to have to reveal it to me. And I woke up the next morning and I was like, whoa, how did my mind go there? And I literally saw sexual perversion. Hmm. And we went out to dinner every night. We were fabulous empty nesters. And I said, let's stay home tonight. That's not the kind of conversation you have in a restaurant. Yeah. And, and I do want to say, like, I like that you saw it. And I, I say this is for everyone to understand. Yes. You saw that there was a demonic attack or that it was a demonic yes. spirit, which I think is just I, yeah. really profound because a lot of people might say, I felt my husband was having an affair. That's way different than saying there's a demon destroying our marriage through oh. sexual infidelity in our, in our life. And I just want to just want to point that out, but keep going. Well, and when I had that dream, I was like, oh, my gosh, how did my mind go there? Yeah. And then I went, oh, my gosh, God is revealing to mm. me sexual perversion in our marriage. And that ne that night, I made dinner and we're talking. And I said, "How long have you been having an affair?" And he's like, "What?" Because you know, you need to remember when people, um, when they're in sexual perversion, they're gonna lie too. If they're cheaters, they're gonna lie. Yeah. It's just the way it is. And I and he knew. I said, "You know that I hear from the Lord, and I wouldn't just come up with this. I've never even checked your phone. I've never." ever been suspicious or been one of those paranoid wives. I just wasn't. Maybe yeah. I should have been, but I wasn't. Yeah. But anyway, he finally, he knew that I knew. He knew that the Lord told me. And he goes, you're right. And literally the man that I loved, that I thought was my soulmate, the father of my children, the person I was going to grow old with and, you know, die with, he literally looked me in the eyes that night and said, I'm going to have to kill you. But that's what happens with the devil wow. is once you give the devil a crack, he's going to come in. And it was like the demons completely 
took over after that. I was actually afraid. But I, and here's what's interesting too, this is, this is interesting, and I talk about this in the book, is I hadn't slept for a long time. And again, I think my spirit man knew yeah. something, that something was wrong, but I didn't, in my head, I didn't get it. Because everything on the outside looked perfect. And the night that he moved out, we had a beautiful home in Montecito, and he moved out into our home in Montecito. And that night, I went around and I anointed every door and every window Mm. because I lived in this beautiful home that God blessed us with, you know, right behind the Beverly Hills Hotel up in the mountains, but it's kind of dark. There's very few street lights and, you know, and, you know, if the if the security alarm went off in the middle of the night and I was alone there, I thought I'm going to freak out. So I wouldn't even set the alarm because I said, you know what, Jesus, I'm married to you now. You are my husband, because that's what you promised me, and you are faithful. You are my protector, my savior, my husband, my provider. He closed all the bank accounts, and I go, you know what, Jesus? I'm your responsibility now, and I went around to every doorway and every window in my house, and I anointed it with oil. Remember how the Israelites put blood over the doorposts for their protection, and I said, God, I'm married to you now, and you're going to protect me, and remember, Sean, I hadn't slept in really years, actually, Wow! and that night, I went to sleep, and I slept 14 hours. The peace of God just fell. was in a coma. (laughs) You needed it. Wow. No, I was so exhausted from everything and so distraught, and I slept 14 hours. And I'm telling you right now, I have never lost a night's sleep except for sometimes the Lord wakes me up in the middle of the night to speak to me and to guide me. Because I always say, God, speak to me, guide me. I can't do this on my own. You tell me where to go. I'm yours. You know, I'll do whatever you want me to do. So I think sometimes a lack of sleep is a stirring in your spirit when there's something wrong, but you don't know in your mind or your body yet. But I believe God will sovereignly guide you and protect you. And that's the advice I give to women. The first thing is you have to forgive. If you don't forgive, God can't be there for you. Yeah, and you can't he can't forgive us. Yeah. And I'm like, I need to be forgiven every single day. Yeah. So, but God will become, Jesus will become your husband. And I have not, ever since I got through my divorce and God healed my heart, I have not had one day of loneliness. It's, a, uh-huh. it's miraculous because I yeah. know I'm on his path. When I think when people hear that, they're like, well, God did that for her. But, you know, how did I'm not I'm not going through restoration. But I do want to remind people who are watching, like, I mean, you went through, of course, you had your family. So your boys go through this and they were adults, but you had them go through this. You had your extended family. But then there was a very public, um, very public oh. scandal in it because the media wanted to cover this because of everyone involved. And so you, you carried on a number of different levels. And so talk about some of the, when when you were kind of at some of the hardest points, how did God come through? Like, how did, how did you know you were going to make it all the way through? Like, where where was that place in God where it's like, you're with me. And I, I I know I'm going to, I know this isn't my story. This isn't the end. And this isn't my story. This divorce is not my identity. Like I'm getting through it. So when did that start? Well, when I was going through the divorce, I, I'm telling you, Sean, I weighed 90 pounds. Mm. My hair fell out. The top of my hair went completely gray. My the skin color was gray. I was flat. I mean, I was just flat. even my sister said, Oh my gosh, there was no diction in your voice. You were just flat. And it's hard to heal when you're being constantly attacked. Yeah. So I always say, you know, healing comes when all this is over. I, you know, God was still my strength, but my real healing came. During the divorce, I would go out and I just became Forrest Gump. I didn't know what else to do with myself because I was living in this beautiful big home in Beverly Hills. And I felt like I was in a body where the soul was gone. It was no longer a home. It was not a family dwelling. My kids, my sons didn't come around because they were upset. And every time I saw them, I would just start bawling. You know how that happens. Mm. So I wasn't a bowl of cherries. And I would walk, and sometimes you're so distraught that you can't even pray. So I would literally go, help, God help me. I need your help. And I would listen to podcasts and I would listen to worship music. And, but it's a journey, it really is. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think God, 
wants us to rely on him. And the more we draw to into him, the more he starts healing our heart. But we can't just, it's like praying for a job and sitting in your apartment and not going out on interviews. We have no. to do our part. Yeah. And I had to do my part. It was gut wrenching. But even my doctor said, you know, I think I, I need to put you on, you know, um, medication, you know, depression medicine just to, until you get through this. And I'm like, I can't. I can't numb the pain. I have to feel this. I have to gut, gut my way wow. through. It. And wow. it's tough. No, none of this is easy. But I'm telling you now. I'm like, God, I have the greatest life in the world. I get to be used by you. I get to have a ministry with women who have gone through divorce and a ministry with women to pick yourself up and men. There's a lot of men who've been yeah. betrayed. Yeah. You know? And God allows me to help people, a single women financially. And there's a story in the Bible how God, I mean, in, in my book, how God gave me that heart when I was in Caesarea. And I get to sell those and my book sales and, you know, my products on Drewville.com. And I feed it into the Hammered Heart Foundation, hammeredheart.org. And I go around to churches and I set up a Hammered Heart Fund. Wow. And I get to help single women who cannot pay their electric bills. I mean, yeah. women do, people don't realize how tough it is. There are millions of single women in this world that can't pay their bills yeah. because all of a sudden they had no job skills and now they're responsible and you know they have menial jobs because they may not have a college education or they may not ever been in a workforce because they were full-time moms. So God always turns lemons into lemonade for us. What was the what was one of the points where you felt like because we don't recognize the the drew of the book of what you just described of having like your hair falling out your gray skin and the, uh, ninety pounds we see you in your strength obviously but what was the point where you were like okay I'm back or like this or God's doing it or like God's like the tipping point so to speak was there a moment where you're like okay you showed up like you said but like God showed up was there or was it just all the way along through the story. Well, I think the first two years, pardon the pun, but I was being so hammered because yeah. it was the David and Goliath and he had a team of attorneys and he had made sure that he had prepared this situation in case I did know oh, wow. or did find out. So, you know, I was getting hammered and one day I got up and it was our last mediation and I did not want this to go into court because I didn't want my sons to read about it. And yeah. because there's the Hammer Museum in LA and Armin, Armin Hammer back then was, you know, well known, whatever. And I went out on a prayer walk and I said, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to trust in you. And I said, I need you to show me what I'm supposed to do in this divorce proceedings, what's fair for everybody. And I literally got back and I played the Russian roulette with the Bible. I just opened it up to see what it <laughs> yes, was all. Well done it. And literally, I came to this verse. This is your day in court. Take your strongest argument. Wow. Wow. Uh, wow. And I said, God, give me the number. And I didn't think the number was fair. And I went in. And I gave the number and they didn't accept it. And I walked out and they came running down the hall after me because they don't want to go to court either. You're looking at yeah. millions of more dollars. But here's the thing, Sean. It was not fair. And guess what? This life isn't fair. If we think this life is fair, there's there's only justice in God's kingdom. Yeah. And it will all be just and it will all be fair in the end. But sometimes we all go through situations where you're like, wait a minute. That wasn't fair. I renovated 27 very large properties in the Beverly Hills area. I made tons of money. And what I came out with was so unfair that I can't even tell you. He took most of what I made, but that's not what's important. I get in the elevator and I said, God, how did this happen to me? How did I get so hoodwinked? And I pushed the elevator button and the Lord spoke to me like that. And he said, Drew, that man has never been your source. Mm. I restore, and I restore all. And at that moment, I was like, okay, God, let's do this. And I have wow. never looked back. I've wow. never looked back. Oh, it's so profound. I love that because, again, it tells the story of 
you've just walked it out with God. You've literally taken the That's steps with God do. each way. I think, you know, if anything, I want to encourage everybody because we don't have enough time for all the stories. And there's so many good stories here. And I've never said this on my show before. I didn't put it down. I literally read it all the way through. Except, well, I, I slept in between. Oh. But I mean, it was the first thing I did. I was like, I got to finish the story. I got to find out what happened. And I haven't been wow. gripped by someone's someone's book in a long time like that. And I did, again, I didn't have a context for your family. I didn't really have a context for you. And so, so you told a story that to me, it's one of my favorite kind of stories because in our generation, we need stories that give us a full vision of what God can do. And right. you've done it. You've done it we through this book. So I want to encourage hope. everybody. And it is, you need courage and hope. And this book's going to impart it to you. And, and maybe you're not, maybe you haven't gone through a divorce. I haven't gone through a divorce. And I still was gripped Great. by your faith and your stories. It just gave me courage in so many other areas of life. So I want to encourage Thank people to get you. the book. Drew, how do people, you've mentioned some organizations before, but can you just kind of walk us through organizations that you're involved with that people can get a hold of you? And I know the book they can get yeah. from anywhere it's sold. I mean, Barnes and Noble's Amazon everywhere, but yeah. tell people how to get a hold of everything. Well, and I also have a website. You know, I've renovated now over 40 properties, and my sons tell people that they grew up in Whoville because I did <laughs> Palm Beach with hot pinks and lime greens. So I thought, well, Drewville, that's the perfect name. Since that's I amazing. Drewville. So Drewville.com is where you can buy my brands, the book, also on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. But, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone knows this is not about me. This is about being able to fund into my foundation, into God's kingdom, so I can go out and do more. Because God says he blesses us to be a blessing. And that's what I'm all about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we end, can you pray for people who are going through, oh, maybe they're going through divorce oh or betrayal? Just, yes. give them, just give them faith right now. I just know that God's yes. going to use you. Yes, yes. Jesus, first of all, we thank you, God, that we could share your glory today. Because, God, you became my husband, my provider, my comforter. When I hit rock bottom, God, you were there for me and you comforted me. And, God, you saved me. And I just pray that if there's anyone out there right now that is going through, maybe not even divorce, but any kind of struggle or devastation, God, I pray that we can relinquish our power from trying to do it ourselves mm -hmm. and come to you. Because, God, you created us to have a relationship with you so you could save us. But we have to come to you first. And that's the beauty of this life. We're not robots on you know, we're not robots. We're not puppets on strings. But God, you gave us a free will. You gave us a choice because you love us that much. But you created us to have a relationship with you. And God, anyone listening today, let them know that yes. all they have to do is say, Jesus, come into my heart as my Lord and Savior and forgive me, Jesus, for my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross so I can come to you in purity that my sins are forgiven. And from this moment forward, God, I give my life to you and help me when I can't do it on my own. Thank you, Jesus. And God, we thank you that you heard every one of those prayers and that you are a faithful faithful God. And I just pray that lives are changed through my story and my testimony, God. And I give you all the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Well, Drew, your story is stunning. Amen. I'm going to encourage all Amen. of you to visit drewville.com. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me, Sean.